Thanks very much. Uh, I've had a pretty good setup so far, and right up front I'll tell you this is a bit of a sales pitch. Uh, and hopefully uh, I'm going to set up Deborah Fisher for the Livoire talk uh, with, with a little bit of background and, and at least a little bit of a push. And in uh, a previous Sarah question, you know, she mentioned you know, the search for are we alone. And I think it's uh, even broader than that. And astrobiology is asking, you know, where did we come from? Where are we going? Uh, and are we alone? And I think these are the driving questions not only for uh, astrobiology, but for cosmology as well. And so whatever future large telescope that we build to try and look for you know, signs of habitability or habitable exoplanets, we also want to address general cosmology as well because we're part of a much bigger community and these large investments are going to be something that we have to share across uh, the sp spectrum of politics. Uh, this is an image from the Deep Space Climate Observatory uh, spacecraft of the Earth and the Moon and imagine the moment when we have not an image but at least a mental image of another system that's like our home planet. The problem is, and Earth 2.0, as we all know, is going to be incredibly faint. Uh, how faint, you may ask? Uh, fainter than the faintest galaxy in the Hubble Deep Field. And so this is the grand challenge that we have ahead of us. Uh, you've heard a number of talks that are addressing you know, either networks, uh, addressing planetary atmospheres about uh, you know, planets that are sub-Neptunes, planets that are rocky Earths. We're not just looking to be lucky to find that one rocky planet around a very near stellar system, M star. We really need to assume that we're not going to be lucky and we want a large number of planets to look at, not only because we want to try and find a planet that might be habitable, uh, but also because we want to try and understand the context and the range. Because if we're not lucky, we still want to do great science and we want to understand what the prospects are. And so this is a chart that shows uh, the diameter of the telescope that we might build and the exo-Earth candidate yield. So this is just a subset of the planets that we might see. And you, and you can see here you know, that if we want to get two or three, you know, we can build you know, a small telescope, if we want to get hundreds of planets to interrogate, uh, we're going to have to be up in the 15 to 20 meter telescope size. So really, if you just get to the ch cut to the chase, uh, you need a telescope that's bigger than about 15 or 16 meters. Uh, now, that's a big telescope. Um, but it makes a big difference. Uh, and I don't want to ping on anybody's small telescope keeping in mind that I'm a Hubble hugger, and Hubble is 2.4 meters. So, uh, but size does matter. Here's a 4-meter telescope. Uh, this is the exoplanet yield looking across the spectrum of planets from uh, rocky Earth-like planets to Neptunes to Jupiters. And this is the kind of histogram you can get with a 4-meter telescope in a reasonable lifetime of the telescope. Uh, and it's pretty puny. We're not going to build a scientific enterprise around this. If you go to 16 meters, now you're talking about you know, lots of uh, rocky planets, lots of Neptunes, and even a reasonable number of Jupiters. And this is showing the breakdown between hot, warm, and cold so that we even have more distribution. This is uh, Drake Deming's you know, great uh, spectrum of a, uh, happens to be a hot Jupiter. And the question is, is this characteristic of all hot Jupiters? And the answer is no. You know, when you go and look at a number of them, which is remarkable that we can do that at all, um, but we start seeing that every one of these is different. And this was a significant investment, 498 HST orbits. Uh, so there's also a time factor. So this is the great cartoon that we show, showing a spectrum of, you know, a rocky planet with an atmosphere, and wouldn't it be great if we could measure the scattering in the atmosphere, oxygen and ozone lines, you know, some indication you know, from sessions on either side of us of you know, colors that indicate you know, signs of life, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane. This cartoon, though, is a relatively high resolution spectrum. And you, know, you look at this, and this has a resolution of, you know, resolution of you know, somewhere around a few hundred to be able to get something of this great detail. And we'd love to get this. This is then 
when you jump to the simulations of what you get from a four meter telescope and it's not that great cartoon. And the, the other factor that was mentioned earlier is for a coronagraphic telescope you're also limited by the inner working angle. You get a cutoff uh, just below one micron. Clicked. This is what you can get with a 16 meter so it's quantitatively much different and you get to go to longer wavelengths cut off by the thermal limit of the telescope rather than by the diffraction limit. And so the other factor is that big telescopes are much faster. You get the spectra higher resolution, you can separate the planet from the host star, and you can get it in much less time. This is just a, a quick picture that shows you the longest observable wavelength for a star at 10 parsecs. And it's that inner working angle that's a function of lambda over d. And it changes as you go in wavelength simply because of that lambda dependence, the wavelength dependence. And so if you're trying to separate a star from an Earth at 1 AU, you get cut off just below 1 micron. For M stars, it's even worse, of course, because the habitable zone is so much closer. If you go to a 16 meter telescope, as you go to longer wavelengths, you get to water feature just below a micron, and you can keep going all the way up to the thermal limit of the telescope. So the big question on the table is, if we see a spectrum like this, and we see some statistically significant dip, uh, one resolution element around the water line, you know, what does that allow us uh, to say what will be perhaps the greatest scientific discovery uh, ever made. Um, and I think we want to have data that looks something like this, uh, where we can definitively say where we have several resolution elements. Uh, the other factor is it'll take about 10 days of observation to make a spectrum like that, to take one, and about an hour with a 16 meter. So we can cover a lot more exoplanets to make that discovery. Our resolution goes from a re resolving power of about 70 to 500, signal to noise ratio 15 to 50, uh, longest observable wavelength I talked about. Uh, so with a four meter telescope and those kind of observation times, you can only examine about 12 exoplanets at that low resolution versus hundreds with a 16 meter. And of course, we know where all the stars are. So it allows you to go from you know, 10 parsecs out to 30 parsecs. And you get to do all the rest of the cosmology and, and galactic astronomy. Another important point is that the larger your telescope and the shorter the observation time, you can also do what we've done with epoxy and Galileo, is actually build maps of these exoplanets through multicolor photometry. And that's because you can observe uh, multicolors and have exposure times is at 10 parsecs with a 16 meter, you can get a number of observations per day and watch the rotation of the planet just from the color changes. Uh, with a 12 meter, you can get to about an hour, 8 meter, you're at a few hours, and a 4 meter, you, at least with a planet that rotates in 24 hours, you're spread out throughout the whole day and you can't do it. And that's important because if you see color changes that indicate continents and oceans, that almost certainly infers plate tectonics, which figures into our you know, origins of life. Of course, I mentioned that it can do a lot of other astronomy. For instance, uh, a 2.4 meter Hubble, here's a surface image of Pluto. Not so great, of course, we have New Horizons. But with a 12 meter, uh, you can start to get resolutions on Pluto at 210 kilometers. Uh, here's geysers on Europa, something we hope uh, plumes that we would be able to do. With a 12 meter, you can certainly resolve those. And the other factor uh, that we heard is we really want ultraviolet and optical, and that's something that uh, is, is plausible. So here's uh, an at last concept. You know, this is something that is really the next step beyond James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, and when we start talking about, well, 12 meters versus 15, won't a 15 or a 16 be much more expensive or even a 20? And it turns out that the price of the optics is only about 15% of the overall observatory. And so if we build a 12 meter and we get a great spectrum of an exoplanet and we see some feature, we don't want to be in the position of saying, wow, that looks really interesting. Now we have to build the bigger telescope to find out if it's really important. Uh, this is actually me. We know how to build telescopes. We know how to work on telescopes. Human spaceflight is building architectures already 
uh, for the 2020s that involve robotics, that involve people. So this is a notional idea of how you might be able to assemble using the Orion spacecraft and the Space Launch System, which is also important for Europa, to build, in this case, a 20-plus meter telescope. And these are astronauts with large segments snapping them together uh, like Legos. So if we really want to find out this answer, if we want to get the high resolution spectra, if we want to look at networks, if we want to look at complexity, if we want to look at multiple spectral lines and, and lots of different planetary systems to be able to make sense of where the Earth sits, where Venus, Mars sits, and where our potential Earth 2.0 might be, we need to be bold. And uh, today actually is Hubble's birthday, Hubble's anniversary on orbit. Uh, so I want a quick show of hands, although this audience isn't quite like the biology-centric ones, but how many people in the audience are younger than 27? You have never known a world without a Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> Sadly, that won't last forever. And what is going to be our next ultraviolet uh, visible telescope? We don't know the answer to that. And we're going to have to create that future. The Hubble wasn't created by a decadal survey. It was endorsed by it. The James Webb Space Telescope a truly audacious telescope, October 2018 will launch, wasn't created by the Decadal Survey, it was endorsed by it. Uh, so, you know, I think as astrobiologists, we need to create the future that we want to see, uh, and we need to be bold and ambitious to do that. So, I'm excited because I think we all can imagine the moment uh, when we do find that Earth 2.0, or we do learn about a lot of different habitable planets, but we need to create that moment. Thanks. Time for a, a few questions. Thank you, John, for that talk. Uh, do you envisage uh, something like the 16-meter telescope that you were talking about, that it would be mostly a follow-up uh, of known planets or discovery of new planets? Because the former requires a critical mass of targets that, that are appropriate, and, and the latter will require more time to get the same amount of spectra as follow-up. Yeah, I think the good news about a, the larger your aperture, the faster your observations. And so you can, you can do both. You know, we'll certainly have, from the Transient Exoplanet Survey Satellite, lots of transiting exoplanets to look at, mostly around M stars. But the other good news is if with a large telescope, say a 20-meter telescope, you can very quickly, at low resolution, do direct imaging to identify the planets we know all the spectral types, so we'll be able to identify planets in the habitable zone with relatively fast observations. And then you can triage those to decide which ones do you want to follow up on. And so it's, it's very general purpose. The challenge will be arm wrestling with the cosmologists, you know, looking at uh, you know, distant galaxies and the folks who are doing galaxy surveys, looking at individual stars in the entire local group, doing what we've done with Andromeda and Julianne, Julianne Del Canton's uh, University of Washington work. So. Thank you. Um, we have two more minutes, I think. Uh, but I, I just wanted to ask you uh, something related. It's not exactly a science question, but uh, uh, so let's say if people are not excited enough for, for finding life on other planets, cosmologists, okay? And if it, what, what can we? I know. <laughs> what can we do? Um, so if you have some kind of a presentation like this, or if you want to talk with them, so what can we do? Because it needs to be some kind of a general astrophysics mission more than an exoplanet mission. So contrary to everyone's belief, it's JWST is, uh, as, is an astrophysics mission. It's not exactly yep. an astrophysics so. Yeah, J James Webb Space Telescope is a good example where when it was started, you know, the total universe of known exoplanets was exactly zero. Yet. If we were to design a telescope that was optimized for exoplanets, we'd build James Webb Space Telescope. So we were lucky, but we were lucky uh, deliberately in that we built a general purpose observatory that was very good at a lot of different astronomy. And you know, if you were to build a 16 meter you know, UV visible telescope, like a very large Hubble, it will be tremendous across all areas of science. And so even if you're a cosmologist who's really interested in the search for life in the universe, but also you, know, you have your grant to do you know, the, the most distant galaxies, earliest galaxies, uh, you can appreciate the astrobiology question, but you know that this telescope will also be really great uh, for your work. And almost anything that you know, 
Hubble is doing, a larger Hubble would do. And then it's up to peer review uh, and competition to decide how to actually use the telescope. But I, th I think everyone is interested in you know, the question of are we alone? I, that's a, kind of a universal question. So, thanks. Uh, one really quick question. Uh, very quick question. Um, how much of your vision, um, you're speaking here about the telescope, but how much of the vision is also about those Legos being put together up in space by human beings? So, so I'm a scientist, but I'm also an engineer and an astronaut. And so I, I like to jump to the, okay, how are we going to do it pretty quickly? But I think you'll hear next that you can get pretty big without having to invoke astronauts assembling things. But on the other side, I'm looking at a human spaceflight enterprise uh, that, quite frankly, for at least the last eight years has been going sideways. Uh, we have great capabilities, but we don't know where we're going or what we're going to use them for. And so I see this as, as sort of bearing uh, the vision of, you know, what should humans be doing in space, and what should we be doing as scientists? That you know, it's, a, it's kind of a, an opportunity for us that we'll have all this capability to put people in space, to put robotics in space, to put large things in space. Uh, well, let's use that wisely. And what better use than building a big telescope to find out if we're alone in the universe? Uh, following on that, so one of the big differences between Hubble and James Webb is serviceability, and that James Webb has none. Uh, do you think that serviceability is going to be an important part of the future space telescopes? I think that the question of serviceability beyond whether you assemble it or not, which is a completely separable question, is really important. The reason why you saw in, in Daniel's talk these amazing wide field camera three spectra, dispersed you know, spectra, is because we could put in wide field camera three, you know, 25 years after the telescope or 23 years after the telescope was put up. And so serviceability, you know, once you have a basic optics that are good, the serviceability allows you to put new instruments in that keep the observatory vital. The James Webb Space Telescope should hopefully last about 11 years, which 11 or 12 years, which is its propellant margin, and then we're done. Uh, you know, today we're celebrating Hubble's 27th anniversary. That's part of the power of Hubble. So I think the serviceability is a critical role. And, and Congress actually coded that in the authorization, NASA Authorization Act of 2010, that requires all future observatories to evaluate when practicable, I think they used the word practicable, <laughs> serviceability. So, uh, so we, it's by law, we have to do it. Let's thank uh, John Grinsel. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>